Hi everybody, Physics Ninja. Some time ago I made a problem with uh, six pulleys and blocks connected to them. Uh, in all of those problems, I didn't include friction in the problem. They were kind of simple. Uh, in this case, what I want to do is I want to include kinetic and static friction. And I want to look at different cases dealing with this incline setup. So I have two blocks connected by a very thin string. They go over a pulley and we're going to neglect the mass of the pulley. Uh, but I will add kinetic friction and static friction to some of these problems. Uh, the first three problems that I want to look at uh, have to deal with either motion that's at constant speed in one direction or the other. So either up the incline or down the incline. Uh, question C says, well, what range of values do I have for this hanging block M2 so that the system doesn't move at all? So this is a problem uh, for Newton's first law, right? The, both blocks are going to be at rest. Now, in the fourth case, what I want to do is I'm giving you the mass of M2. What I want to do is find the acceleration and the tension in the case where there is friction, at least between the block M1 and the incline. All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, so for the first problem, what I want to do is I want to find the value of this block over here, M2 for which this block M1 is going to move up this incline here at constant speed once it is set in motion. All right, so a couple key words when I read this. First of all, it's going to move up the incline and it wants to do so at constant speed once it move once it's set into motion. All right, so again, when I read this, I mean the first thing that jumps out of me is this here should be kinetic friction, right? And since the speed is constant, the other thing that jumps out at me is the acceleration of both blocks has to be equal to zero. Okay, so this is really a Newton's first law problem, okay? Uh, there is no acceleration for either of these blocks. They're both going to be moving at constant speed. M1's moving up the ramp, M2 is going to move down. All right, let's go to the next page now and consider the free body diagram for this situation. So first thing we're going to do is set up free body diagrams for each block. Okay, so the easiest force to put, uh, M1 here has a value of 3 kilograms. So there is a force of gravity acting on that block, acting straight down. I can get a value for that. M2, I don't know what the mass is, but it has a mass M2. Therefore, the weight has to be M2G acting down. I notice there is a string connecting the block, so all you do is you go where the string is connecting to the block, and I just draw a vector pointing away from that point. And again, since the string has a very kind of uh, small mass, the pulley, we're neglecting the mass here, so the tension is uniform. There is only one force of tension. It's the same everywhere. So acting on block M1, it's like in this direction. Acting on block M2, it's acting straight up. Now, uh, block M2 is resting on an incline. So guess what? There has to be a normal force between those surfaces. And the force is always perpendicular to the surface. I'm going to call that just capital N for normal force. That's it for that one. All right, now I have to be careful, okay? Because it is moving at constant speed once it's set into motion. And it moves up. So guess what? I am going to use a coordinate system that has this direction as being positive. Right? If that one's moving up, that means this guy here has to be down. This is going to be what I'm going to call positive for block M2. I am free to do whatever I want for this coordinate system, but it's just the easiest. This is kind of a tip from Physics Ninja. Right? If you know the direction of motion, always set that direction to be positive. Now I still have to add friction. Since I'm moving at constant speed, we said there was going to be a friction force, and that friction force is always opposite of the motion. So if I'm moving up like this, guess what? My friction force has to be like this, and since I am moving, it has to be kinetic friction. Must be. There's no choice. Now if you remember for a couple things. So for kinetic friction, we know the direction now. The magnitude is simply given by that coefficient of kinetic friction and multiplied by the magnitude of the normal force. That's the definition of that force. Now, the other thing that you need to know is how do you deal with this block here on an incline? Now, we've done many, many examples of problems like this, and there are two components that you have to look at, okay? What you have to do is you have to break this force down into two components. All right, there's a component of the weight that is perpendicular to the block. I call that the weight perpendicular. And this guy here is mg cosine of the angle theta. 
And then there is a component of the weight that is also acting down the ramp, okay? And I call this the weight parallel. And the weight parallel to the ramp is always mg sine of the angle theta, if you've defined the angle theta down here. Uh, go look at my other videos if you're um, just looking for a refresher on this. This is really, really important. All right, so I have all the forces down. Now what I want to do is look at each block. All right, so let's look at block M1, and let's look at block M2. Now we're going to write down uh, Newton's first law again. There's no acceleration, so uh, it's really the first law at work. And the first law, remember what it says for the first law is you simply add up all the forces acting on the block, and they have to be equal to zero, right? That's the first law. All right, so for block M1, how am I going to do this? Well, again, I look at this coordinate system right here. It has positive going up the ramp. The only force that's acting up the ramp is the tension, so I write plus T right here. The, there are two forces acting down the ramp. There's this component of the weight, okay? Since it's down the ramp, I'll put a negative sign in the front, minus M1G sine of the angle theta, and the other force is the force of friction. The force of friction is minus Fk. Again, I put the negative sign there to remind me that it's acting down the ramp. Since I'm using the first law because the speed is constant, there is no acceleration. I simply set that equal to zero. Now let's do the same thing for block M2. Okay, for block M2, again, I'll just choose positive to be down. So what do we have? We have M2G acting down and then minus the tension acting up. And that's it. There's only two forces acting on that one. It has to be equal to zero. Now, another little trick that I often do whenever I have a tension or two blocks coupled by a rope. Notice in one equation, it's plus T. The other equation is minus T. I really want to get rid of tension here. So what I want to do is simply add up both of those equations. If I add up both of those equations, those terms are going to leave and I'm going to be left with this expression. So I'll have M2G from the second equation here. Then I'll have both of those terms minus m1 g sine of theta. And then minus, instead of writing fk, I'm just going to substitute my definition here. It's mu k multiplied by the normal. This here must be equal to zero. All right, let's work at eliminating what this normal force is. Well, the normal force for this one now, I have to look at the equations or the forces acting in this uh, direction. So I have the normal here acting perpendicular to the ramp going up, and I also have this guy acting inside the ramp, right, in that direction. So both of those forces have to balance out. So you must also have this expression, that the normal minus that component of the weight, this here must be equal to zero. So remember, when you have a block on an incline that's sliding, this is my expression for the normal force, just rearranging that, bringing this term to the other side. All right, we're just about done. All we have to do now is just go ahead and eliminate that normal force. So we're going to go ahead and rewrite this equation here, equation star. So we have M2G minus M1G sine of theta minus the coefficient of kinetic friction. And here I substitute in uh, the normal force. Again, I sh I'm talking about block M1 here. So it's M1G cosine of theta equals to zero. Now, before I substitute some of those values, really what I want to do is just simplify. I notice I have little g in all the terms. And I want to get m2 by itself because that's what I'm looking for. Find the value of m2. So here you have m1 sine of theta. And then plus the coefficient of kinetic friction. Again, you still have an m1 here. Actually, what I'm going to do is just factor out m1 and multiply that term by cosine of theta. All right, that is it. This is the final expression. That is the expression for the block. If the block M2 is equal to this value right here, the block is going to be moving up at constant speed once it's set into motion, okay? All right, so here we can substitute our values. Let's go ahead and look at this problem here. So we have M2 equals to, uh, this is three kilograms, uh, sine of the angle 30. The coefficient of kinetic friction was 0.3. This is cosine of the angle 30. All right, if you go ahead and you put everything in the calculator, I think at the end I got a value of 2.28 kilograms. Okay, so that's the requirement for problem A. Let's go ahead now and look at problem B.
All right, problem B says, find the value of M2 again for which M1 moves down the incline this time at a constant speed once it starts to move, right? Once it's set into motion. So I've kept the forces here. I've eliminated the friction because the friction, I have to change the direction because I am now moving down the incline and we know that kinetic friction always acts opposite of the motion. So I'm gonna draw it down here. This is my force of kinetic friction, but the tension, the weight, those are all the same. Okay, so we don't have to do those. The other thing I'm going to change is I'm gonna change my coordinate system. It's a different problem. I could leave it the same, but I wanna stick with my tip. My tip said just always choose the positive direction to be the direction of the motion if you know what it is. All right, so this one, if I'm moving down the ramp, block M1, I'll choose positive to be down the ramp. I'll choose for block M2, block M2 is gonna be moving up. So I'll choose that to be the positive direction. All right, now we write down Newton's first law for both blocks. Again, all I want to do is I want to add up all the forces acting on each block and set that equal to zero. So I'm going to have two equations. I have an equation for M1 and I have an equation for M2. All right, so uh, for M1, let's look at all the forces again. Uh, look at the forces acting down the ramp. There's this weight parallel to the ramp. So that value was M1g sine of the angle theta. And I put a positive in the front. That's acting down. There are two forces acting up, so I'm going to do minus the tension and then minus this kinetic friction. And right away here, I'm just going to save myself a step and I'm going to write it as the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal, m1g cosine of the angle theta. That's it. Those are all the forces acting along the ramp. That has to be equal to zero. All right, for block m2 now, there are two forces, so I have t acting up minus M2G acting down, that there has to be equal to zero. Again, my goal is to eliminate the tension, so the easiest way to eliminate the tension is simply to add up both of those equations to get one new equation. So when you do that, you get uh, M1G sine of theta, again, minus mu K, M1G cosine of theta, minus M2G all that equals to zero. Two zeros on the right-hand side there. You can simplify some of the terms, the g's here, again, multiply all the terms. And at the end, I'm looking for m2, so I simply bring it on the other side. So we have our final expression for m2 here is, I'll factor out an m1 since it appears in both terms. And it looks pretty similar to the first expression, except now what? I've switched the sign, right? Uh, because now, oh, I've gotta be careful here, cosine of theta. Okay, uh, that is my expression now for in this expression, right? What is the value of M2 if I want things to move down, right? If it's going to move down, um, again, the value of M2 here is going to be a little bit smaller, okay, than the previous case. Because now, um, the only thing I'm going against here is the weight acting down. That's the only thing that is providing any force for that block M1 to move down. So we substitute our values now. Guess what? We're going to get M2 is 3 kilograms multiplied by sine of 30 minus 0 0.3 for that kinetic friction cosine of 30 degrees. Put everything in the calculator. and We're going to get a small value. In this case, I think I got 0 0.72 kilograms. All right, let's now go to problem C, which was a case now that is not moving. All right, so it's going to be looking at static friction in this case instead of kinetic. All right, problem C says, for what range of values of M2 will the block remain at rest, or the blocks will remain at rest if they're released from rest? So again, this is a first law problem. The difference between uh, part C versus the other parts is the other parts, they were moving at constant speed because they were forced to move at constant speed, right? Here, they're released from rest. So this case here is really, you have to use the static friction coefficient here. So let's remember the force of static friction. I'll call it Fs, okay, instead of Fk. Now, it looks like it's written by a coefficient and the normal, but it's not an equality, okay? It's an inequality. There is a range of values here of this static friction. If you wanted to write an equation for static friction, the only way I can do that is if I take the maximum value, if I set this equal sign here. The maximum value of the static friction equals to the coefficient multiplied by the normal force. So this is really what we're going to use here, okay? We're gonna look at two different cases. Uh, first of all, let's look at case one. Case one is 
the maximum value of R2 uh, of mass M2. Maximum uh, M2. Okay. Let's think about this, right? As I start adding mass here, again, there is a point now where it's going to start pulling on here. Now, where would the force of static friction be? All right, the static friction tries to oppose the motion. So here I would put the force of static friction like this. As I keep adding mass, this force can get bigger, right? And get a little bit bigger. It can only get bigger up until it reaches this maximum value, okay? So that is really what I'm going to write here, right? This value can only get so big, I can keep adding weight here up until I reach that maximum force of static friction. If I add one more gram on this side here, basically the system's going to start to move because the forces are no longer going to balance. So for the first case, we consider this, this one right here, this free body diagram. So nothing's changing for our blocks. Again, there's nothing moving. So um, we could free to choose any direction to be positive or negative. I'll just stick to this one right here. So for block M1, we write the free body diagram. For block M2, again, we write the free body diagram. And it's gonna look very similar to the two other cases we just looked at, except now I must use this static friction. So for block M1 here, I'll just write it like this, T minus, Oh, actually, just to be consistent with that coordinate system here, I had positive to be down. So I should say M1G sine of theta uh, plus the force of static friction, the maximum value, right? Uh, I'll call this mu S N. And again, a minus the tension here has to be equal to zero. For block M2 here, you have that the tension minus M2G has to be equal to zero. Again, you can make this substitution for the normal. This should be M1G cosine of theta. So in the next step, we proceed exactly like we did in the previous cases. You simply add up both equations and we're going to get our expression here. So we're gonna have M1G uh, sine of theta uh, plus coefficient of static friction this time, M1G cosine of theta. The tensions are going to cancel out minus M2G. Take my red pen, go ahead and get rid of the M2s, and I get an expression that looks very, very similar to the previous one. Um, again, factoring out the M1. The only critical difference here is now I'm using this coefficient of static friction. So for this case here, it's M2 cosine of theta. All right, um, mu s cosine of theta rather. Now I substitute my values. I get M1, which was three sine of 30 degrees, 0 0.4 this time for that coefficient of static friction, and cosine of 30 degrees. All right, put those values in the calculator, and I got uh, 2.54 kilograms. So that is, if it was released from rest, that's a very important statement, right? That's why I'm using the static case. All right, so for the minimum value now, all I have to do is I've cleaned that up. I changed the force of static friction now, right? Because the min as I make this smaller and smaller, the block M1 wants to slide down. So the friction opposes that motion, right? So it should act opposite of where the block wants to go. So that's why I've changed that direction. Now this force FS can only get up to this value. Once I reach the maximum value, guess what? I am no longer, um, can no longer get any bigger than that value. So let's go ahead now set up our Newton's first law for both blocks again. So the force acting down, M1G sine of theta. All right, force is acting up minus uh, force of static friction, Fs max. What else? Minus the tension, that's it, equals to zero. That's for the first block. For the second block, again, same thing as before, right? T minus M2G equals to zero. Add them up, same procedure, okay? I add them both up, and again, I could substitute the value for the static friction maximum force. So you're gonna get M1G sine of theta. The tensions cancel out. I replace this value minus mu S multiplied by the normal, M1G cosine of theta. Then I'm still left with this minus M2G if I add up both equations. Again, you could also just isolate tension and substitute it into the first equation. It's mathematically equivalent to that. Uh, get rid of the little g's. Isolate M2. That's what we're looking for, M2. 
All right, so group some of the terms together. M1 can be factored out, so you get sine of theta. In this case, you use the negative sign here, right? It's negative that friction term. All right, that is my value for the minimum value. And now what you get is, what, three kilograms, sine of 30, minus 0 0.4, cosine of 30. Um, at the end, I think, if I put that in the calculator correctly, I had a value of 0 0.46 kilograms. Okay, that was the minimum value. All right, so as long as M2 is within this range here, we found the maximum and we found the minimum here, 0 0.46, and here I had 2.54. Again, it's measured in kilograms. Um, as long as we're within this range here, this system will remain in equilibrium. <clears throat> it will remain at rest if it was released from rest. And that's the key point. When you release something from rest, uh, you use the coefficient of static friction, which tends to be a little bit bigger than the kinetic. So it gives you a little bit more range here for these values. Anything less is fine because it just means that the friction force, for example, if I have mass is equal to one kilogram and I set it here, that's going to be fine, okay? I'm just not gonna be using the maximum force of static friction, but I'm okay because static friction can actually be even smaller than that and the system will still be in equilibrium. But if I make this block M2, for example, like in the last problem, right, M2 is, for example, say five kilograms. Well, in this case, I'm outside of that range. I will not be uh, remaining at rest anymore, okay, because this force, this weight is too big, and it's going to offset anything that is acting against it for the system. So let's go now and look at a case where we're outside this range and we're going to accelerate up the ramp. All right, my last problem says find the acceleration of the blocks and the tension in this case where I've set the value of M2 equals to 5 kilograms. Now remember, this is bigger than my maximum value, so it definitely is going to be moving. If it moves, it automatically means we have to use kinetic friction, right? And you know it's going to moving because they're asking you for acceleration. So in this case, since I'm bigger than the maximum value, the force of kinetic friction is going to be acting down, right? Uh, this weight here is big enough to overcome both of these forces here, the weight parallel of M1 and the force of kinetic friction. So we're definitely accelerating here. So let's go ahead and write down our Newton's laws, except there's a very important difference now. The right-hand side has to be equal to mass times acceleration. It's not equal to zero because we are not moving at constant speed. We are no longer at rest. So this is what it looks like for M1. Again, I choose my coordinate system that is directed along the motion, which in this case, you know, is going to be up the ramp for M1, moving down for M2. So my equations of motion look like this, T minus, I'll go ahead and I substitute in right away this value for the weight parallel to the ramp, it's M1G, sine of the angle theta. What else? Minus my kinetic friction, uh, mu K, M1G, cosine of the angle theta equals. Now I'm done with all the forces here in that direction along the slope. So it has to be equal to mass m1 times the acceleration of that block. Now both blocks are going to have the same acceleration, right? Because they're not getting closer together and they're not going farther apart. They're always have the same distance between them. So the acceleration is going to be the same. So there's no need to add a subscript here for that one. All right, for this block m2, what you have here is uh, M2G acting down minus the tension acting up. That has to be equal to M2A. So that's it. Now we have to solve. There's two equations and two unknowns. Again, I, I like proceeding just by eliminating the tension at first. I'm going to solve for acceleration and then I'll use my value for acceleration to substitute back into the equation. So let's first get an expression for acceleration by eliminating tension. Uh, you can do that by adding both equations because I have positive T here and I have minus T here. So easy way to eliminate them is to add them up. Let me just start off by writing this term here, M2G. And then minus, there's two, two terms here that have to do with M1. Let me factor out the M1G. G. And here I'm left with sine of theta. Okay, what else? Plus, uh, here I have mu K, cosine of theta. Okay, that here has to be equal to, now I've added both equations. 
So here I have M1 plus M2 multiplied by A. All right, we keep going now. Uh, the only thing we have for A now is um, just divide through, right? Get rid of this M1 plus M2. So keep this whole term the same. M2G minus M1G sine of theta plus mu k cosine of theta and divided by the sum of both of those masses, m1 plus m2. All right, once you have that, you can substitute back into the equations to find tension. I'm probably going to use the second equation here. It's just simpler, right? If I know acceleration, you could substitute that inside the equation. Um, so if I rearrange this equation right here to get tension all by itself, it should look like this. m2g, I bring t on the other side, and I bring this whole term on the other side. I get m2a. And now all you do is you take this value and you substitute it right here. Now I'm not going to get some large algebraic answer for this. What we're going to do here is just substitute in all our numbers. And let's get a value for acceleration and let's get a value for tension. And then we've solved the problem. We know everything here because I've told you this second block has a mass of 5 kilograms. All right, we substitute the numbers in the calculator. Uh, we should get uh, something that looks like this. The acceleration, I think I got 3.5. Uh, 3, 3 meters per second squared. Uh, the tension, again, you know, M2 is 5. Little g, I use 9.8. Uh, substitute the acceleration I just solved for. I obtained a tension of 32.4 newtons. Okay, so that's how you can do the dynamics case where things are accelerating. Okay, you're just applying Newton's second law in this problem versus the third law. It all comes down to reading the problem carefully. Clearly, if they're asking for acceleration, uh, it's really Newton's second law that is at work. In the previous two, they mentioned words like uh, constant speed, right? Uh, speed, that is an indicator to me that is, there is no acceleration. And in problem C, we had the blocks were at rest. So clearly this here would be the first law. All right, that's it for me, folks. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you uh, got something, uh, gained some good knowledge from this video. Thanks for watching.